and welcome back to the library after lunch. Um, my name is Stacy Peterson. I'm the adult services manager here at the library, and we're so glad to have you here. Before we get rolling this afternoon, I just wanted to check in and see how many people traveled more than an hour to get here today. Raise your hand. Do you mind telling us? today. <laughs> it's okay. Well, we came here from a thousand miles away. All right. Anyone who's more than an hour away, do you mind telling us where you're all from? Who me? Oh, uh, Frederick, Maryland. Okay. North of Chicago. North of Chicago. Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs. Newport News, Virginia. Newport News, Virginia. Yes. Geneva, Nebraska. Geneva, Nebraska. Wow. Stratford, Iowa. Stratford, Iowa. Woo hoo! <laughs> North of Detroit. North of Detroit. Wow. New York State. New York State. West Michigan. West Michigan. Orland Park. Orland Park. Probably <laughs> <laughs> being what it is. <laughs> Florida. Fort Myers, Florida. We got some Floridians in the room here. Anyone else? Belvedere. <laughs> Any others? Yes. Hopedale, Illinois. Illinois. South of Peoria. South of Peoria. All right. Thank you all for making the long trip to be with us. We're so glad you're here. Now, our speaker today is also is one of our faraway visitors. You're from Texas. <laughs> all the way from Maryland be with us and we're so delighted that he has that he has made that trip. He's going to be presenting our second lecture of the Batavia Lunal Symposium from Batavia to Air Motor. Mr. Gillis is the editor of the He's the author of two books about wind electric power and he's currently writing an academic history of the air motor of Chicago, whose origins are right here in Batavia. And that's what he's going to talk about today. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Gillis. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I have the honor uh, to keep you all awake after lunch here, so I will do my best. I'll be looking to see who's sleeping, so. But anyhow, um, I guess um, to get started here, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into, uh, into the uh, windmills. And um, I had um, gone abroad in 25 years ago, I guess it's been now, um, to Belgium. And while I was there, I got to know the family who um, maintained the National Archives for the Belgian windmillers. And so they asked me, oh, you would like to go see a windmill? And I was, I was like, sure, because I like, I like woodworking and things like that. I knew they were uh, uh, wooden machines, so to speak. So I got to go and tour and uh, go and uh, spend some time with some windmillers. and. Uh, Went from there, so when I came home, um, went to college, I got into water pumping windmills uh, under a variety of ways. I had um, uh, a couple academic uh, research grants and uh, explored their use in uh, developing countries. So, and then I got to know Dr. Baker over a number of years as well and a couple of books I've, uh, I've worked on. And then he kindly uh, got me involved uh, with this uh, book about the history of air motor. And he's my mentor and my editor for that, which will be published by Texas A&M University probably the latter half of next year. So it's been a lot of work. I've spent three years on it. And uh, some of you folks out there have actually talked to about it in, uh, over the, uh, those years as well. So uh, I want to thank you all. Um, go ahead and get started. Um, I'm giving you a presentation today on uh, how Batavia influenced two um, gentlemen who formed uh, what became probably the biggest and uh, most powerful windmill company in, in the industry. So I'm um, going to go ahead and get started here. Batavia is distinguished as a center for the country's once vibrant windmill manufacturing industry. Led to this place along the Fox River in 1863, Business partners John Burnham and Daniel Halliday both saw Batavia as a gateway, so to speak, to more easily supply their popular wood wheel windmills to the thirsty west. Their firm, U.S. Wind Engine and Pump Company, knew how to both manufacture innovative products and market them successfully to newly minted farmers 
uh, across the Great Plains who needed water not only for themselves but for their livestock and crops to survive. And what better way than using a windmill to pump that water hands-free to the surface? It's companies like U.S. Wind Engine which through its labor-saving product offerings inspired other individuals to explore and invent mechanical devices to improve living conditions on farms and ranches and in small rural communities of the day. The purpose of my discussion today is to explain how two young Midwestern men were influenced by U.S. Wind Engine and how they ultimately built one of the most highly regarded windmill brands in the world. Mm. Oh, Dr. Baker, I thought you had all the quirks worked out of this thing. Uh, it's, is it on? Oh, someone turned it off. I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't. I was, sorry. We're all learning here. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. From the 1850s uh, to the early 1870s, the majority of American commercial windmills were made of wood uh, held together with metal rods and other hardware. Many farmers uh, liked the ability to repair their own windmills when parts wore out or became damaged. And wood made this task easier since it could be found around the farm or secured from the local community via you know, uh, sawmills, cabin makers, and whatnot. On top of that, farming operations, especially in arid country, could scarcely go along without a steady flow of water for their households, livestock, and gardens. A broken windmill needed to be quickly fixed and easily brought back into service. In the 1870s, a handful of manufacturers began to challenge the predominance of all wooden windmills on the market by, de by designing and selling units made with all metal wind wheels. This is no easy feat, or was no easy feat I should say, since it was challenging to the engineers of these companies to build windmills that were lightweight, rugged, and balanced to effectively use the wind. Also, to make these windmills commercially attractive to farmers and, pri and price competitive with their wooden counterparts, the material costs to make them had to be kept in check. Many early manufacturers of all metal windmills knew this well, since they already had shops with skilled labor and proper tools to fabricate reasonably priced metal agricultural implements and other iron and steel based machinery. In March 1892, the Farm Implement News published an article explaining the emerging trend of all metal windmill construction during the uh, past 20 years and its direct correlation to America's steel industry. The author of the article wrote, the cheapening of steel through improvements in the processes for producing, producing it and the growing scarcity of good lumber have brought steel extensively into use in the construction of agricultural implements and machines where lightness of design, rigidity, or elasticity, strength and durability are, pre are requisites, steel is superior to any other material. And its present cheapness permits it, uh, its use for every purpose which it is suited. Indeed, this is truly the age of steel in its application to agricultural machinery. Also, you know, steel conveyed a sense of industrial strength and durability. Yet, it wasn't easy at first to convince farmers of steel's value in windmills. Even by the early 1890s, some windmill manufacturers refused to embrace steel. While the debate about the superiority between wood and steel windmills raged, a young inventor and engineer by the name of Thomas Osborne Perry would put the design of the windmill uh, mill, windmill wheels to thorough scientific testing, something that had not been done in such detail since the 1750s when English physicist and engineer John Smeaton presented his windmill efficiency research to the Royal Society. And, uh, this is a nice young photo of uh, Mr. Perry when he was uh, getting ready to enter university. So uh, this photo is probably, many of you haven't seen it, it's before he donned the beard. Thomas Perry was born in Tecumseh, Michigan on February 28, 1847. He was the only son of Gideon and Mary Osborne Perry. Based on his own writings and expressions from peers, Thomas Perry was considered a deep thinker, but not boastful. 
1865, at the age of 18, he entered the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor to pursue his education. He received his Bachelor's of Arts in 1869, and from 1869 to 1871, taught Latin, Greek, and mathematics at a high school in Ypsilanti, Landing, Michigan. He then returned to the university for two years, receiving the degrees in civil and mining engineering by 1872. In addition to a Master's of Arts, for the three years he taught school and postgraduate work. Quote, this is an interesting quote from him, which I like. He says, as to titles, and he reflected on this for 40 years later, I have always called myself a mechanical engineer, as my occupation has been mostly mechanical and generally experimental, for some of which I have been paid, various, uh, been paid by various manufacturing concerns, and for which I have sometimes paid pretty dearly myself. Mm. Mm, let's see, go with the next one. Here we go. Okay. Once he finished graduate studies, Perry returned to Tecumseh, Michigan with a passion for original investigations, in particular windmills and their performance. In June 1873, he filed for his first patent application for a windmill that revolved horizontally on a vertical shaft. Perry's windmill, which consisted of four vertical wings, challenged him to investigate the importance of gear ratios to ensure that changing wind speeds, or wheel speeds, I'm sorry, from variable winds did not harm the machinery that they powered. Gideon Perry must have supported his son's work since his signature appears as one of the two witnesses on the patent application, pictured up here, actually, right, uh, right there. Um, so he, he obviously you know, supported his son's work and then let him indulge in it. And the patent office awarded Thomas Perry his patent on January 20th, 1874. While a mile this windmill was surely constructed, its fate is unknown. In 1876, Perry moved to Batavia, Illinois to become a draftsman for the U.S. Wind Engine and Pump Company, by then one of the preeminent American windmill manufacturers. He acted as a solicitor of patents, um, or as he described it, a designer and investigator. From June 1st, 1882 to September 15th, 1883, Perry Wood conducted a detailed series of tests on windmill wheels, design, windmill wheel designs and their efficiency. And I actually uh, circled, uh, hopefully you all can see on back, but just in case you can't, that's Mr. Perry right there. I, uh, when I got this picture, um, uh, a couple few years ago from the, uh, Carl actually uh, got that from. I took some time to study that picture looking for Mr. Perry and uh, happened to find him there modestly on the side. So, F, um, let me continue here. F.H. Noel, uh, head of the U.S. Geological Survey's Division of Hydro, hydro, uh, Hydrography, recollected at the time Perry carried out his experiments at and I quote, although millions of dollars have been invested in the manufacture and purchase of the mills, and much attention has been given to the mechanical details and the saving in weight and cost, yet comparatively little study has been bestowed upon actual efficiency of various forms and upon their development toward theoretical ideals. And R.L. Aldre, another um, observer of agricultural implements from the time, put it more bluntly, stating, before Perry's scientific work on the windmill, many inventions in the agricultural implement industry were the result of a, quote, moment's inspiration or a crude experiment, often on the part of an unlettered farmer, end quote. In fact, most wind wheels were constructed of narrow wooden slats set to angles with the plane of the wheel ranging from 35 to 45 degrees as a rule of thumb. Perry said, quote, the slats were usually placed as close together as possible without having their projections on the, on the plane of the wheel overlap. The proportions of the sail, surface, and their angles of weather were apparently arrived at without any well-defined purpose. The only experiments made in the United States, so far as could be learned, relating to the starting forces, uh, related only to the starting forces. They did not include the measurement of work in foot-pounds, end quote. Oops, what did I do? 
Oh, you know what I did? I'm sorry. I, yeah, how do, sorry about that. I will learn this. Okay. Great. Okay. I hope you got a good look at that uh, picture that was up there earlier um, of Mr. Perry. Um, this um, actually was um, produced for um, when he uh, was able to publish his research in the late 1890s. Um, you'll notice that this is middle-aged Perry, so he was a lot younger when he did these experiments. I always thought that was kind of an interesting uh, anomaly about that uh, particular uh, picture that gets, uh, is widely used. <clears throat> Perry's experiments were conducted in a room at the U.S. wind engine uh, plant in Batavia. His test apparatus of gearing, pulleys, and belts was suspended from the room's roof trussels. And you got to actually see an animated presentation uh, from that this morning, which was quite interesting. And as you learned, too, it was necessary for uh, his experiments to have a consistent wind velocity, and thus he used a small steam engine to produce steady air stream as well to test various wheel, uh, wind wheel patterns. The, as uh, also explained, the door to the room was guarded and the windows closed so as not to, to disturb the air during testing. It's estimated that he made more than 5,000 measurements and tested 61 different forms of wheels including curvature of blades, types of construction of materials, and best management methods. Perry concluded that it is better to divide the uh, wind wheel between fewer sails. He also observed that smaller wind wheels in the range of eight foot in diameter could be made just as efficient for ordinary water pumping purposes as the 10 foot and larger ones of the day. However, U.S. Wind Engine and Pump Company's management was not convinced by Perry's findings to change the, uh, their windmill products, which must have been a blow to the young engineer. His research notes, property of the employer, would not be viewed in total by the public until 15 years later when they were published with permission of the company by Perry through the U.S. Geological Survey. By this time, many windmill companies, including U.S. Wind Engine, had incorporated principles of Perry's work in their all-metal windmill wheel designs. After presenting his research, Perry, Perry quietly left Batavia for Chicago in 1883. One long, uh, one long time inhabitant of Batavia uh, later reckoned that Perry, quote, did as much as Halliday did to advance the popularity of the windmill, but who knows anything about it? He's just one of our forgotten engineers, end quote. Laverne Noyes was born in Genoa, New York, on January 7th, 1849, the son of Leonard and Jane Noyes, he was the youngest of four children. The family moved to Springville, Ohio, Iowa in 1854 where Leonard Noyes operated a farm. As a, as a boy, Laverne Noyes showed an interest in mechanics and knew that he wanted to eventually become a manufacturer. He enrolled at the newly started Iowa Agriculture College, as you all know today as Iowa State University at Ames in 1868, and graduated with a Bachelor's of Science with a focus on engineering in 1872. Immediately after college, Noyes moved to Marion, Iowa, where he entered the agricultural implement business. He received his first patent in 1875 on a pulley-based hanger, uh, which was used for basically it's what it is. It's basically a farm slide swing gate. So that's where his first patent was in, which he manufactured and sold to wholesale hardware dealers. It was also during this time that he learned the difficulties of business, spending upwards of $5,000, which he didn't have. Noyes then joined uh, forces with a man named Plummer in Springville. And it's interesting, as I researched, I've never been able to find the man's first name, whose name is Plummer. So it's, uh, it still eludes me. So if anybody knows that, uh, please tell me. <laughs> but uh, he joined this man named Plummer in Springville to begin manufacturing hang tools. As you can see, some of the different things he made up here. At this time, uh, uh, by 1876, I'm sorry, Noyes patented an improvement to the hay carrier. At this time, he had resided for a, a short period in Batavia, Illinois, and had attracted the attention of one of U.S. Wind Engine's founders, Daniel Halliday. In 1876, U.S. Wind Engine sold the Noise and Plumber anti-friction hay carrier, 
which is right here, uh, just in case you have trouble seeing it. And this, uh, let's see, the and would continue. The company actually would continue to sell uh, the device for for 20 years. In January 1878, Norris received a patent for an improvement to horse hay forks. He also patents simpler devices such as the hay pulley, marketed by U.S. Wind Engine as the noise pulley, which is this one over here. Oh dear. Besides the widespread name recognition afforded to Noyes through the, his relationship with U.S. Wind Engine, it allowed him to generate earnings and pay off his $5,000 debt. Chicago, by the early 1880s, was a vibrant city with massive construction projects underway and a substantial manufacturing base. This was a far cry from 1871 when a four-day fire in October destroyed an area of about four miles long and a mile wide. While much of the city's business district was incinerated, its large stockyards and meatpacking plants, lumber yards, and grain facilities, in addition to its railroad tracks on the south side, were unharmed. These industries helped Chicago quickly rebuild and increase its population from 300,000 to more than 1 million within a decade of the fire. Large employers, such as McCormick Reaper Company and the Pullman Car Works, set up operations in the city. In addition, there were numerous small manufacturers collectively hiring tens of thousands of people. Chicago's expansive uh, railroad hub also helped the city prosper as its products could be transported in abundance throughout the United States. During his stay in Chicago, Perry partnered with Noyes. It's unclear when these two men first met, but it was likely during Perry's employment at U.S. Wind Engine. Together, they designed at this time when they were together a low down self-binding harvester which Deering manufactured for the commercial market. After completing the work on the harvester, Perry moved back to his hometown of Tecumseh to continue his windmill experiments. And from 1886 to 1887, he constructed a water pumping windmill which he called the air motor. Some referred to his uh, windmill as the mathematical wheel also, again, because of all the science he put into it. Through numerous tests and calculations, Perry designed his windmill to work efficiently in the lightest of breezes, as well as maintain its integrity both operationally and structurally in high winds. On Perry's invitation, Noyes traveled from Chicago to Tecumseh to see this windmill in operation and realized there was a significant business opportunity in the making. While his interest in inventing new agricultural implements continued, Noyes started a new manufacturing uh, venture in the early 1880s based on his invention of a distinct, distinctive dictionary stand. I hope you all can see it. I know this one's probably a little small, but you can give an example of it right there and, and uh, here. And uh, it, it has been said that he got the inspiration for the stand from watching his wife, Ida, a writer and artist of rather petite stature, struggling with heavy dictionaries, atlases, and other reference books of the day, and some weighing upwards of, of 10 pounds apiece and unwieldy to handle. In July 1881, Noyes received a patent on his first portable book holder. He continued to refine the stand's design and usefulness. His dictionary stand business was located on the fourth floor of, building, of a building at 42nd and 44 West Monroe Street in downtown Chicago. The stands, which broke down easily for shipping, were sold in numerous libraries and schools in addition to individuals and promoted through various mass merchandise catalog retailers and product wholesalers, you know, such as uh, Sears and Roebuck Company. Noyes claimed to earn net profits of between $15,000 and $18,000 a year from 1885 and 1887. And it would be this money and other secured funds that helped him start the windmill business based on Thomas Perry's designs. Besides his innovative metal wind, uh, wind wheel design, Perry also developed a geared pumping mechanism behind the wind wheel that would inspire traditional windmill manufacturers to make similar changes to their machines. And, and that took place a lot in the 1890s. Perry, during, during his experiments, realized that his uh, more nimble wind wheel turned faster in the wind than the average wood wheel uh, wind wheel and could start in a breeze of as little as four miles per hour. 
windmills until the uh, late 1880s had single stroke pumps, meaning that for every 360 degree turn of the wind wheel, the pump rod would complete a single stroke. The faster the wind wheel turned, the quicker the strokes, causing a jerky and potentially damaging action on the pump rod. Perry developed a system of back gearing to give the windmill a more consistent and smoother operation. Noise, after much consideration, decided to name the firm the Aeromotor Company. And originally, uh, just a little side note, originally the Aeromotor name had a umlaut over the first, uh, over the E. So, and that dropped off pretty quickly uh, after several years. And this was also, again, the name that uh, Thomas Perry came up. And there's a lot of uh, uh, misinformation out there about noise being the one who came up with the name. And, and actually, Noyes never truly took credit for it. It was, uh, if you read Noyes' writings correctly, it was, uh, this was uh, Perry's, uh, you know, a name that he came up with. So, um, the, and again, I, a little explanation about the name, and this is what, uh, how uh, Noyes put it. And I quote, since the wind motor embodies the suggestions and teachings of the researches and experiments of the only competent engineer who has in modern times undertaken a thoroughly scientific and exhaustive investigation of air as a mode of power, we feel entitled to coin and appro appropriate to its exclusive use the name air motor, literally meaning air motor. The term windmill is a misnomer. At best, since in former times it designated the grist mill, which was run by, air, by wind as distinguished from one run by water, hand, or other power." Quote. In 1888, the newly formed air motor, motor company may not have appeared to be much of a threat to the numerous established windmill manufacturers on the uh, American market of the past uh, 10 to 20 years. Noyes, president of Air Motor, must have known from the outset that he needed more than just his ambition to survive and carve a name for himself in the industry. Fortunately, he already had experience working with one of the giants of the business, U.S. Wind Engine, which gave him the opportunity to understand both its strengths and weaknesses in the market prior to forming his own company. He also retained uh, his consulting engineer, Thomas Perry. The Air Motor Company officially started operation at its location uh, of Noyes' uh, dictionary stand business. That first year in operation, Air Motor claimed to have manufactured and sold 45 windmills. In 1889, pressed for space, the company was relocated to a six-story building at 110 and 112 South Jefferson Street in Chicago, where Noyes took out a five-year lease, believing the space would suffice for a number of years. That year, 1889, the firm made 2,288 windmills. Still, this space was not enough and the company relocated again in November 1890 to a much larger property at Rockwell and Fillmore Streets, about four miles south from Chicago City Hall. From this location, the company was also afforded more direct access to America's rail network. Windmill output from this new factory site took off, with 6,268 units produced in 1890, followed by 20,049 in 1891, and a whopping 60,000 by 1892. With claims, of produ with claims of producing a complete steel windmill and tower every three minutes during the workday. Even the economic recession of the early 1890s failed to dent the company's steady stream of customer orders for windmills. Air Motor Chicago factory in the early 1890s contained, contained some of the most sophisticated foundry and milling equipment of the day. For the machinery it could not acquire, Air Motor made it. Noyes also understood the importance of material flows in manufacturing, which surely impressed, impressed many of his contemporaries of the day, including his former employer, U.S. Wind Engine. Quote, with these machines, hundreds of steel towers can be turned out in a single day, the company 